Jefferson, Iowa is located in West Central Iowa and is a community with a rich football history over the last 100 years. In 1988, the towns of Jefferson, Scranton, Peyton, and Sheridan consolidated their football programs. Through the years, the county has had world-class athletes that went on to collegiate and professional success, including all-pro defensive end Bryce Pop and track star Brent McLagan. The county has not only had awesome individuals, there have also been approximately seven truly memorable football teams in the last 100 years. In 1985 and 1986, Peyton Sheridan won the Class A state championship before the county consolidated schools. Other great teams on the list include the 1928 and 1929 Jefferson football team that only allowed six points over two years. The Ramblers won the prestigious Coon Valley Conference Championship. Reviewing the records from the Jefferson team since 1948, we see that the 1952 team went 9-0 and was the only team in the entire nation that was unscored upon. That team was led by running back Gordon Micklerath and coached by Frank Linduska, who is the namesake for Linduska football field to this very day. In 1959, Jefferson fielded another Stinger team, going 9-0 and winning the Midwest Conference Championship. As we look at the records in the last 37 years, the 1991, 99, and 2006 teams experienced state playoff success. The 1999 team is the only squad in school history to be one play from reaching the state championship game. This documentary tells their magical and exciting story from that season 24 years ago. That is it! JSBC 6, Harland nothing from Merrill Field, the biggest win in JSBC history! The celebration is on, the Rams are going to the dome! It seems funny to say the 1999 team was one of the greats in county history because they started the year with only one win against three losses before they went on an improbable run of success under head coach Bill Kibbe. So Coach Kibbe, can you tell us a little bit about your assistant coaches at Jefferson? We had a lot of great coaches there, but three that were outstanding with me all the way through. Tom Powers and um, Sawhill and John Turpin, they had been the part of the staff for quite a while. You knew you could turn it over to them and uh, really get the job done, but they were three outstanding coaches that we had during that time. All right, so Coach Kibbe, was the 1999 team your best playoff team? Definitely the best playoff team, and, and they went the farthest and uh, just did a great job. So Coach Kibbe, do you think the 1999 JSPC Rams deserve a shot to be in the Green County uh, Hall of Fame? Oh, I think they definitely do. They and won in the playoffs, and I just thought they did a great job and very deserving of getting into the Hall of Fame. So, Coach Kibbe, if I remember right, your dad and Coach Blatt's dad from Harlan were on the same high school or same college team? It was the same high school team uh, that played at Harlan. He was on one side, my dad was on the other side uh, when they were playing together, too. Wow. Going into 1999, the Rams were coming off a dismal 1998 campaign where they finished sixth out of eight teams with a record of just two wins and seven losses. The odds for a memorable season seemed very low. On the opening kickoff of the season, Preston failed to field the return and JSPC recovered, setting up a quick 20-yard touchdown drive capped by a Matt Fye touchdown run. Things were looking up. It would be the last touchdown they would score for eight consecutive quarters. It was not looking good. In week two, JSPC played an equally awful offensive team hosting the Carroll Kemper Knights. Through four quarters, both teams scored zero points and headed to overtime, where both teams went three and out and also missed both of their field goal attempts. In double overtime, both teams would score a touchdown, but JSPC missed their extra point, sending the Rams to district play winless. Morale was low. Could they recover?
points rarely came easy for the Rams, but in week three, they were able to score eight touchdowns and rout the lowly Sadal Eagles, setting up a showdown with the Carroll Tigers in week four. Carroll was coming off the district title in 1998 and had a reputation for being cocky about their talents. The week four game was characterized by a 14-14 tie going into the fourth quarter. JSPC drove the length of the field, but had their field goal blocked. Carroll then drove the length of the field to win the game. With the loss, JSPC wouldn't be able to lose another game if they wanted to contend for the district title, and thoughts of making the playoffs seemed like a pipe dream. Probably the toughest loss we had was the Kemper game, and not only was it a rock'em sock'em game that was 0-0 at the end of regulation, but it was also the fact that we couldn't kick a field goal or extra point save our lives. And the fact that we went to two overtimes and missed an extra point that would have put us in a third was incredibly frustrating. Part of the reason why I think we were a mediocre team to start with is and start out one of three is we didn't know what a winning how to win close games. We didn't know how to win in general. We didn't know how to finish a game. And it was all a bunch of close losses and mental mistakes and understanding how how do you take and get that final win, that final play that takes you over the top. Bill, what will we look for from ADM? Well, ADM has a very good football team. They've got an outstanding quarterback. I think he's probably the best in the district. Uh, he can uh, scramble. He's always going to roll one way or the other, and uh, if he doesn't find anybody open, He's going to be scrambling, so he looks like he's got very good quickness, and he's going to be very hard to contain. He's got uh, the top receiver in the conference and Chapman. Uh, so we're, we know we have a work cut out for us because uh, with that passing threat and then a very good running attack uh, with Chapman and Wishner uh, to run inside, our defense is going to really be tested this week more than probably any time this season. Goal. It's a 27-yard try. Left footer. It's a low shot. It is good. Three to nothing. ADM. And staying with the shotgun, the draw play to Lautner. Breaks one tackle. 40. Near sideline. 30. Great block. 25. Spins through it. 20. 15 and out of bounds. First down. It is Defy. Right side. Cuts it back up. Positive running room. 5. 15. 10. 5. And down at the two yard line. A touchdown saving tackle. Goal. Give to Lautner. Touchdown. Rams are ahead, 6-3 with a PAT. First down, and 10, wanting to throw to the corner of the end zone. Touchdown! Kept one Beautiful foot in, play. Kenny Chapman. Right, one left. Rolling right, Knutson. He fires, and it is caught. Is it a touchdown? Yes. Yes. Minute he kicked for left footer. 
Michael gets it down and through, and it's 16 to 7. That's correct, Rick, but at the other hand, you've got that Jetman, who is a good player, a good running back. These linebackers have to stay home. They have to respect that running back because uh, if they don't, he's gone. He's, he's a quality runner. That's the beauty of this offense that ADM is running right now. It's a college offense with great balance. In the middle of the third quarter, John Minahan intercepted a pass, and then a few plays later, Matt Fye made a miraculous catch on 4th and 15. The Rams' season's fortunes seemed to change after those plays. Check it out. Throws, it's picked off! Minahan picks it off and dives down at the 39. Oh, great anticipation, Joe. Net 10-yard pickup, it's, it's, worth the, uh, it's worth the chance. Fye's a wing right with split backs. Briggs on 4th and 15 being rushed again. He does get it away. He's got five. And it's caught. It's caught at the two-yard line. Oh, my. Marker was there defensively. Briggs put a beautiful spiral up. And Matt Fye gets his first catch of the year, Joe, on 4th and 15 to the 2. He's able to grab it in. Just an outstanding individual Power play. Power eye, Lautner. Touchdown. 16-13 of the PAT upcoming. Speeding that defensive line. Key folks, extra linebacker in their fumble. Rams have it. Rams have it. They tried the reverse in the fumble. Todd Walker and it's Luke Ball. Briggs gives it off left side. Erickson, big hole at the five, at the one. Touchdown! The Rams are ahead with 155 to go in the third. That was a huge hole off the left side. Give it to Wisner. He He's bounces off one man and is in. Touchdown. They were tied. No space for running by the fullback. Out for the lead. High snap. Ronnie gets it up, and it is good. And ADM leads it 23-22. From the ADM 5. Five out of there. Power eye set now. Briggs to Watner, bounces it outside, cuts it back in, and he's got yardage down to the one, I think, maybe the two. All right, from the one. Give up the middle. Watner spins, dives, reaches. Touchdown. Touchdown. Matt Watner does it again. His third one-yard run tonight. The Rams are back up. It's 28-23. Folks, when you see this game, that run on the film on Wednesday night, Think of the word effort and desire because that's all it was. He, he was hit. I thought he was going to be stopped for a one-yard loss. Good clean hit on him, but effort and desire by Matt Lautner gave the Rams that touchdown. What a play. One of the great one-yard runs you'll ever see. Rams will line up to kick up by five. Lautner's the snapper. Good snap to the older Briggs. And Dobbindak, the kicker, puts it for it. Fourth and two, Jetman has a first down. Jetman is going to have one man to beat. Caius got clipped. Caius got clipped. Here's a throw down the middle, incomplete at the 15. They're, they're just uh, using up so much time. There's an option and a nice defensive job by the Rams. They hold the quarterback to a short game. And, but the, and it's in the throw. Back across the middle, Rams have the coverage incomplete. Quick pitch, left side, it's fumble, it's a fumble, it's loose. ADM fell on it, it was loose for some time. And they've got one play left, ADM. One the quarterback left Kedusha, the got back rolling. on it. And timeout, and it's the last ADM time. Got a look at is uh, number 37, uh, Kenny Chapman on the Burton far side. Near side. Chapman far side, Kedusha, he's going to throw it deep. He's looking for Chapman. It's Fire incomplete, time. it's incomplete. It's incomplete, and it looks like all those close losses are going to turn into a victory for JSPC. 58 seconds to go. They threw down the goal line to Chapman, and the Rams are going to be undefeated against ADM at home. They're going to be 4-0 and win a close ball game. Tyler. And uh, one more time, Briggs has to take a knee, does, and that's it. I it's feel a happy so good for these coming. kids. A close win instead of a close loss. And boy, does that ever feel good. We're just broadcasters, Joe, and we're almost giddy. I, I tell you what, because after seeing that heartbreak, look at that staff, look at the kids. Unbelievable. And I, I tell you what, it's just, you feel so good for them. Last week, that just that, that loss to Carroll, and they, they left so much on the field, and I was really nervous tonight, Doug. I thought they, they were just would have been fragile coming out tonight, but just so great mental toughness and, and to win a close game and to do it once again with the opponent driving 
uh, for the winning touchdown, but making the stand and making the plays, and they made plays in that last and that last drive against ADM. And uh, my hats off to the Rams. Tell you what, my hats off to the staff to get this team ready this week. It was tough. The turning point of the season was definitely the homecoming game against ADM. The reason being is we had just lost to Carroll. They're our rivals. We had a chance to win the game, and once again, we didn't. We didn't know how to finish in that ADM game. It was back and forth. We were down, and we went for a play. It was an 86 fake uh, pass rollout by Briggs, and he threw it up. And Phi grew six inches, picked it out of the air, falling backwards. And from that point on, that was the play. That was what. That was what we'd been searching for through our sophomore, junior, now our senior years. And now the 99 JSPC team knew how to find the closed deal. And we went on one hell of a run. And I point clear back to that play 20 plus years later as the turning point. The Rams found their swagger after the homecoming game and were not afraid to show it. The Perry game in week six was the chance for the Rams to recapture the Cowbell rivalry trophy after the Rams had given it away for the first time in 15 years in 1998. The Rams came to play and blew out the Blue Jays 35 to 14, setting up a week six matchup against the Boone Toradors, who were ranked number four in the state. the betting favorite in week seven. The Toradors scored first, and that would be their only score of the game, as the Rams held Boone 35 points below their season average. In the middle of the second quarter, Matt Lautner had a strip sack on the Boone quarterback, and three plays later, the Rams went in on a Scott Erickson touchdown run. Then, starting the second half into the wind, the Rams drove the length of the field, and QB Dustin Briggs went across the goal line to put the Rams up 14-7. Ball game. Line of scrimmage regular, and Briggs is going to hand it off. Five moves it up the field. Oh, Five, that's a first down, and the Rams have the game won. That is the ball game, folks. Five got the first down, <laughs> and the Rams win. It's at the 19-yard line, a 10-yard gain. Matt Five, and the upset has happened for the third time this decade. A JSPC team has knocked off a top-10 rated team from Boone twice of of those wins in Boone, Joe. In week eight, a 22 to seven victory over Ballard set up the Rams for a win and you're in. Lose and you're out. Season finale against the two win Waukee Warriors. Although all they needed to do was beat a two win team, JSPC started the fourth quarter down 11 to zero. Aided by a questionable failed fourth down attempt by Waukee, the Rams secured two fourth quarter touchdowns and secured the district championship against all odds. And JSPC has come from behind 
11-0 down, winning 14-11 at Waukee, going 6-1, winning the district title in 3A District 7. Either Boone or ADM will tie with the Rams, but the Rams have beaten both of them, and it's on to the playoffs on Wednesday, November 3rd. It's uh, just a great feeling to know that Jefferson made the playoffs. After the start they had this year, people were kind of uh, counting the Rams out. It was exciting for the Rams to make the playoffs, but they drew a ball buster in the opening round at home against number three ranked Denison Monarchs. They had a collegiate level quarterback in Eric Weber's, and the one loss Monarchs were averaging 43 points per game. Could the Rams keep up? In, uh, in the playoffs after a five year absence. Doug, this is just great. First time ever district championship for the Rams. And Joe Gitch, uh, no question that uh, on paper, as we so many times say, when we look at ball games, uh, Dennis and Schleswig is certainly a favorite. Well, yes, on paper, and uh, obviously the, the losing that first game against uh, Harlan, uh, which is uh, the, the traditional power, you have to say that Dennison is a strong favorite. But the old saying is, you still want to play the game, and everybody puts their pants on two, or each leg at a time, and uh, that's why you strap them up and go. And uh, uh, Rick, I know one thing that uh, we've mentioned throughout the year, this is a very scrappy uh, ball club. They really don't give up, so even if they would happen to get behind, uh, they're certainly not going to quit playing hard. And, and Doug, this team, when they started the year, had, I think, just a very few uh, letter winners back. They've rounded into a very good seasoned veteran football team, and uh, it can only carry carry forward into next year and mean real good things for us. But I have to praise the senior leadership that's really developed on this team as the games went on. Joe Gitch, uh, the Rams are going to see a quarterback in Eric Weavers, who isn't real big, but he's completed 57% of his passes. He's put up great numbers in the air. Well, that's an amazing percentage by any quarterback, uh, high school, college, or even there's a lot of professional quarterbacks that would like to complete 57% of their passes. On top of that, I believe he's thrown close to 120 times. He's only had three interceptions. That is, that's an incredible number. As I say, uh, uh, professional quarterbacks don't do that. So uh, this is a well-balanced attack uh, that the Rams will be facing, and they will have to be on top of their game. And the good thing about coming in as an underdog, the Rams play good defense. I'd be a little more nervous if the Rams had to go out and try to outscore an opponent. But this is a, this is a team that plays good defense, and good defense keeps you in games. And if the Rams can hang around, hang around, and get to this thing into late the third and the fourth quarter, you might see then that that's where the upsets happen, and that's how upsets do occur. That's the first Ram home playoff game since the 1991 team came out in the all-black uniforms and upset Webster City 14 to uh, eight. Uh, this is a team, as Rick had mentioned, that started off on paper. Uh, if this team, what you thought, it had gone 500 at the start of the season, I think everybody would have been happy. This team, the Monarchs are third ranked. They're eight and one overall. They were runners up in District Eight. The Rams six and three overall, six and one, and champions of District Seven. We're excited to bring you the special postseason playoff edition of the Ram Wrap Up Show. found out early in the first quarter that Denison's passing game was for real and went down seven to nothing. Could they return the punch? The throw is complete, first down, and then Lichtai is loose. Three Rams don't get him. Lichtai at the 30, the 20. Minahan has a shot, and gets him out of bounds around the 10. They give the other keep inside the 10 to the five, and diving. Is it a touchdown? No signal, the official falls down. Touchdown for the Monarchs, a keeper for Eric Weber's 5.58 to go in the quarter number one. Special teams coach Tom Power squad returned the punch on the very next play with the Rams crisscross return. John Minahan ran the reverse fake and went down the sideline showing off his Tim Dwight level speed. 
Ball taken at the 15-yard line, dropped by five, picked up. The Rams, uh, Minahan has it. He fakes a handoff, comes out to the 20. Minahan, 30. One man to beat. That's left tie. 40. That's a back. 35-20, Split backs. First down pass by Weavers. He's hit. Let's oh. loose. And who has the football? The rest of the first half was a back and forth battle, with JSPC picking off Weavers twice, including a Michael Walker defensive lineman interception. The left side, the far side of the field. Weavers a screen over the middle. It's not. It's intercepted by Walker. 30. Michael Walker. 20. The Rams have the football. Michael Walker intercepts the screen. David Katzer on the tackle. The Rams tied 7-7. Have the ball first and 10 at the 19-yard line of what's beaten third-rated Denison Schleswig. Weavers ended up throwing four interceptions during the game, more than his entire season total of three. Gets it away. It might be picked. It is by Kaya's back at the 10, 15, slips down at the 17 yard line. Shortly before halftime, the Rams mounted a scoring drive to put them up 14 to seven. All the players and fans now knew this was going to be a dogfight till the very end. Throw again, feeling the heat, gets by one man, throws in the run, Kenny caught it at the 10, out of bounds at the nine yard line, Reef Kenny. Another catch, Perrin, Drew Perrin on the stop, split formation. Rams give it to Lautner, cuts it back, Lautner, five, Lautner, touchdown! He wasn't even touched, one minute to go in the half, and the underdog Rams have the lead over the heavy favorite third rank, Denison Schleswig team, 13-7, PAT upcoming. And uh, JSPC, the big underdog, as we talked in the pregame, with a 14-7 halftime lead over third rank Denison Schleswig, and uh, Rick, what about that? Doug, these guys are pumped on the sideline. And I'll tell you, if you don't if you don't enjoy this game, you don't enjoy football. From a number standpoint, the Monarchs have it all over the Rams, and that's exactly what happened the first half. The numbers aren't even close, are they? No, not even close. Uh, we have the uh, Rams for 108 yards total offense, 14 points on the board. You figure that's well, that's what they're supposed to do. Dennison, 243 yards total offense in the first half, 212 of it passing. The big statistic is the Ram defense was able to shut down this Denison rushing attack. Almost 2,500 yards through the first nine games, 31 yards in the first half. That's just an amazing statistic. The Ram defense have ta has taken Denison out of their offense uh, so far. Denison has had to throw ball. Give Denison credit. This passing attack, this waivers. This kid can play quarterback. This kid's a, an outstanding quarterback, and he's got receivers. He's dangerous, but I tell you what, I like the way the Rams have them off balance, and uh, all as we said, the Rams can stay close, get into the second half, anything can happen. We're again, just scrappy, Rick. Doug, I, I have not seen the Rams have better line play in all the years that I've watched Ram football. They're stopping those big running backs right at the line, and the offensive line is giving Dustin enough time to do what he needs to do. It's just superb line play. In the middle of the third quarter, Zach Fox made one of the greatest defensive plays in the 100-year history of Greene County Athletics when he intercepted Weavers and returned it to the house. Who would have thunk it? There's a throw, it's picked off at the 45 by Fox. He might go. 30, 20, 10, and Fox stumbles to the ball. Seven. My Doug, who would have thunk it? Zach Fox, you probably can't hear us folks on the radio. Zach Fox had good under coverage. Reavers under threw the ball. Zach Fox picked it off, ran down the sideline, was hit at the 10, was running out of gas. Two guys hit him head on at the five, and it was like a bull. He bull rushed them both into the end zone for the touchdown. 45 yards, Dalvin Dex kick, good. Rams 21, third rank Dennis's Schleswig 7, 7, 38 to play in the third. It's incredible here at Landeska Field. Later in the third quarter, Scott Erickson made a huge play when he stuffed Dennison's runner on fourth and short to end the scoring threat. The play would end up affecting the game greatly. He's close to 15. I think he's very, very close. Boy, I'll tell you what, uh, if, if the line has been laid out straight, Doug, I think he's short but uh, it's gonna be awfully, awfully close. 
Spyglass is down here. He's short. Chains. The Rams have held. The Rams have held on. Down. Denison finally got their second touchdown early in the fourth quarter when Weber's ran it in, making the score 21 to 14. JSPC came back with a big play of their own, but a 56-yard touchdown pass was called back on a controversial phantom clipping penalty. Does throw it and catches the first down at the 40. Minute ahead, 30, 20, 10, pass for touchdown. Flag down. Flag. We have a flag. Will it be a 44, 56-yard uh, touchdown play? Apparently not. Clipping on the ramp. With three minutes left to go in the game, Dennison was moving the ball swiftly down the field and looked poised to score. First down, just using no time at all. And cats are Rams show blitz. And the football's loose. The Rams have the ball. The Rams have the ball. Matt Lautner has it. The Rams have it with 2.43 to go. There's one of the show. Matt Lautner recovers it. And Dennison Schleswig has to hope now that the Rams will turn it over. But the Rams went three and out and were forced to punt to the Monarchs dangerous return man. Aaron Robbins delivered a big stop. Good snap, they're not bringing a rush and a nice kick by Jamie. Quick tie at his 23 and he's brought down by Aaron Robbins. Aaron Robbins makes the play, Joe. No, he's brought down at the 24 yard line. Great one on one tackle by Robbins. The Rams would have to try and hold them out of the end zone one last time with only 90 seconds remaining in the game. 120 to go, second and one. Waivers to throw, far side, complete to Schwinn. Breaks a tackle of Stutt. Briggs gets him out of bounds. The first Rams bring the blitz. Weavers rolling. Being rushed, throws it. Complete to catcher. Mitch Murphy has him down. Marks have a minute to go. No timeouts left. Again complete and out of bounds. That's Spezer, but pass. Rams show blitz. We can't get to the quarterback. And the ball thrown away. Looking for Spiegel, thrown out of bounds. And we have a flag deep, Doug. Many that's a, I'm sure that's, that's, they're probably going to call pass interference. At the 20 of the Rams, the Monarchs have gone from their 24 in a very short amount of time, in a minute. Still 45 seconds to go. Monarchs need 20 more yards and a PAT to tie it up. Here comes the blitz. Monarchs pick it up. Weavers is hit. Gets away. Throws. Intercepted and the Rams win. The Rams win. It's been ahead at the five. He's up to the 30. The Rams win. Jonathan Minahan intercepts a pass. JSPC is going to the second round of the playoffs. They oh, just have to shake a knee. The Monarchs can't stop the clock. Doug, Jonathan Minahan played some great center field. Tremendous pressure on Weavers. And just good pressure. Weavers had to force the ball. Minahan came up with a big catch. Rams get in that tight formation. Briggsy will take a knee. That's it. They might have to do it one more time, and they might not. And the Rams have pulled a stunner tonight. One of the biggest wins ever at Landeska failed. JSPC unranked seven and three now. 21, number three ranked, Dennis of Schleswig, 14. They'll have to stab it one more time, and then you will hear a home crowd erupt. season is over at eight and two the Rams go to the quarterfinals for the second time ever joining the 1991 team and uh, it's a Monday night game for the Rams last word Harlan was leading ADM 17-7 after three it might be the top ranked defending champion Cyclones I don't think the Rams care who it is they're on to the next round I just want to absorb this Doug uh, it, it's just a, a, a bizarre scene on the field, Doug. Uh, this was, the Rams were just such tremendous underdogs in this game. And they did it again. They, they won this game the way that they uh, have come back uh, earlier in the season. And uh, it, it's just, it's once again, it's a tribute to the heart desire of how badly this team plays, how they lay everything that they have out on the field to hold it together 
uh, to win a football game against, on paper, uh, an opponent that uh, uh, just you had to think was vastly superior, but uh, this is a team you don't deny. Again, the Monarchs easily won the battle of the numbers, oh. but the Rams win it on the scoreboard, 21-14. Had one drive for a score. They had a kickoff return for a score, an interception of a pass for a score. Picked up four passes in all. And the fans are out celebrating. The Rams are 7-3 and in their playoff quarterfinalists in Class 3A in the modern. The Rams were now playing the eight-time state champion and six-time runner-up at Merrill Field. Undefeated, two-time state champion and number one ranked Harlan Cyclone stood in the way of the Rams' opportunity to go to the Dome for the first time in school history. size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight and the dog and, and I think about that a lot. Joe uh, Harlan with a 55 and 11 playoff record. Uh, they're 276 and 36 since 1972. That's the first year of the playoffs, and Harlan did win a state title back in '72. They've won eight. Uh, that's 87% wins for 27, 28 seasons. Uh, you don't even make that up, do you? Well, the interesting thing is, how do they do it? And it, it's it has to be starting in the lower grades where they build tradition and then they just go forward from that because obviously over time they've not had the world's greatest athletes although they've obviously had some good ones but it's not and they haven't been blessed with division one or division two prospects it just tells you that there's a program in place down there that knows how to develop young players get them involved in the program get them playing as a team and then they just bring them up through the ranks. The, the finest overall football program in the state of Iowa. I mean, they, you can talk about Emmitsburg and they're close in the same breath, but I think I gotta take Harlan right now. Well, they have eight state titles. Nobody else has more than five. Well, a very exciting time. We hope we have a very exciting game film to show you. And, and let's take a look at the JSPC Harlan State Playoff quarterfinal round. The first quarter was a defensive struggle. The first big momentum shift came in the second quarter when Zach Fox and Luke Ball made big defensive performances on consecutive plays when Harlan was at the JSPC 10-yard line to force a punt. Probably is a throwing situation. They do look to the near side, complete to line it. He breaks a tackle, but yeah. the football, who's got it? I think the Rams do. Do they stay in bounds? Yes. Yes. The Rams have it. Scott Erickson made the fumble recovery, and then the Rams drove 37 yards on eight plays. Scott Erickson then went in from five yards out to make the score six to zero. Nice. The power eye set, new set of downs, first and goal. Give to Erickson up the middle, Erickson to the goal line, Erickson gotcha. touchdown! JSBC leads 6-0 with 2.53 to go in quarter number two. And the home crowd where we're sitting from Harlan pretty stunned as the underdog Rams have the lead, Joe. Well, Doug, here we go again.
The next huge momentum shift came when Harlem dropped a 15-yard potential touchdown pass late in the second quarter, preserving the Rams' lead. Touchdown! Yeah. Oh, he dropped the ball, line and had it at the goal line, Joe. He had the coverage beaten. Lyndon had it in his hands and dropped it. On the very next play, Michael Walker jumped on a fumble to end the threat. Well, this game is once again shaping up somewhat similar to last week, although it's much more of a defensive struggle. This Ram defense has held up once again. They had the big turnover, the big sack, when you thought Harlan was going to go in for the score. What's shaping up as a typical Ram game that we've seen in the last few weeks. All you want is the opportunity. If you're a Ram fan, all you want to be is have the chance to win going into the fourth quarter through the first half of the football. The Rams are there. All of the third quarter was played between the 20s. First game footage is from early in the fourth quarter when the Rams had a huge defensive stand from their own seven yard line. When Zach Fox made a tackle, Scott Schwaller batted a pass and Harlan threw an incompletion in the end zone on fourth down. On the very next play, Matt Lautner took a dive handoff and broke through the Harlan defense for 28 yards to get the Rams off the goal line. And to go in the game, fumble, fumble snap. Who's got the football? Still loose. I think Harlan might have it, Doug. That's... Rams haven't turned it over tonight. Harlan lost it twice in the first Harlan half, and Harlan has it a drop snap. On the first play after the fumble recovery, the Harlan running back tiptoed down the sideline and went inside the JSPC 10-yard line and a personal foul late hit put the Cyclones at the four yard line. On the next play, Harlan fumbled and Scott Erickson pounced on the ball to help the Rams dodge another bullet from the Harlan artillery. A lost fumble for Harlan. Once again, backed up on the goal line, JSPC went three and out and were forced to punt with very little margin for error. Six minutes remained in the game. points. Now pitch to the far side to Martin. Hit in the backfield. Got by the first man. The second man crutches him. It's Luke Ball and then just cleaned up by Matt Lautner. Five and a half minutes to go in the game. Shotgun. Gallagher looking. Being rushed. He said he's down. A loss of five more. And two. I set the reverse. Right on the reverse line into Martin. Rams have it. Ball is oh, it's going to be thrown but incomplete. Pooch punt at Brett Gallagher. Very little rush. It's a short kick. Flag is down in the secondary. Ball hits at the 10. The Rams might have too many guys in the field. The fit is illegal, illegal per participation on part of, the, of JSPC. Four and a half minutes to go in the game. It's been 6-0 since 253 of the second when Scott Erickson ran six yards for a score. A fourth and nine. And now Harlan will go for it. Tight end left. Gallagher rolling. And he gets the ball batted away and complete the Rams of hell. Direct snap, only one back in the backfield. And Gallagher rolls left, big rush by Ball. They've got him, he's down! Big, huge sack! Oh my, it's back to the 12 yard loss. 34 yards. Jonathan 
Minahan. Minahan. Minahan at the 45 of the Rams. The Rams have the football. 157 to go. Fourth Harlan turnover of the night. The Rams have the ball. Harlan with only, I think, one timeout left. The Rams are very close to the biggest win in JSPC history. Here we go, Doug. And so they're going to force the last time out. And uh, just to give up the middle. and to do it on their home field in the quarterfinals on a beautiful night, shutting them out. A 30-yard round, 110 for Lautner on the night. Wow. I tell you what, of all of the things you would have thought, pulling the upset, I never thought the upset could have been with a shutout. And the JSPC football team has done it again. They've won for the seventh uh, time in a row are eight and three and go to the Uni Dome in Cedar Falls. Here's defensive coordinator John Turpin. Congratulations, John. John, what do you say? Oh, my. Wow, what a game. <laughs> what a game is right. And from Merrill Field, the biggest win in JSPC history. The celebration is on. The Rams are going to the Dome. Harlan win was without a doubt the biggest win ever in uh, JSPC Green County football history, shutting the team out on their own home field and remember storming the field and we just basically stayed out on the field till they shut, shut the lights off and pretty much told us to leave. But after that, there was a bunch of crowd supports where the whole county was in it and whether they had kids or not. And, Everybody was fired up to be going to the Dome uh, for the first time uh, in any history of the Ram football. Everybody was behind the team and they were ready and fired up for what was to come. Rams headed to the Dome for the first time in school history for a state semifinal matchup with Central Lion of Northwest Iowa. Central Lion star running back Curtis Eben would go on to be a three-time All-American in college. The game was a barn burner. in the semifinals of the Class 3A playoffs. Bill, uh, probably every underdog team uh, in the state is going to be rooting for you guys. Well, Central Lion George Little Rock uh, is one of the smallest 3A schools, Rick, but with one of the greatest traditions. Uh, when they were a 2A, and now the last several years now that they've been 3A, they've been very, very good. Uh, they've taken over the top spot in Northwest Iowa. You know, it used to be Spencer uh, and now it's Central Lion George Little Rock. Semifinals last year, state runners up in 3A in 96. They've got a couple state titles when they were a 2A school under their belt. And these guys are good, and they're there every year. Uh, they're very quick. Uh, offensively, uh, they have a fullback by the name of Eben, who's just outstanding, one of the best players probably in the state of Iowa. He's just uh, a tremendous football player. He's their linebacker. And, 
uh, he is uh, he would be the same as what our Matt Lautner is. Bill, no wind and an artificial surface. Uh, any special adjustments for that in the way of shoes and so forth? Well, they'll just be wearing tennis shoes. And the other adjustments as far as the artificial surface and the the dome uh, part and receiving plants and kickoffs, we really don't know until we get there, you know, and uh, see how it's going to affect us. So we've never been there. Central Lion has. So I think, you know, they probably had that advantage. But we'll just have to wait to get there, and you have an hour, a half hour to get adjusted to it. So it's not much time, but we hope it'll be enough. We are taping this uh, this program. It's now 9.15. I'm looking at the clock. We're in the Ram Restaurant at Jefferson Scranton uh, Community High School. We're at the south wall, and we can look out the windows, and uh, there's a kind of a mini send-off pep rally scheduled for 9.45, about 15 minutes before the bus leaves. And there are already cars uh, pulling up out there, uh, people getting ready to send the Rams off. There are uh, cars decorated up, and... Uh, It'll be a proud contingent <laughs> heading for uh, Cedar Falls today. The Rams opened the game three and out. Once the Lions got the ball, it took the Rams three plays to see how good Curtis Eben was when he went 44 yards to the house for their only touchdown of the game. Two possessions later, the Rams got their first awful call from the officiating. When Central Lion fumbled and defensive lineman Michael Walker fell on the loose ball, the officials ruled the play had been blown dead. The call proved to be a big part of the game. Oh, that was an awfully quick whistle, Doug. Later in the first quarter, Curtis Eben put a fumble on the ground and Zach Fox jumped on it, leading to the Rams scoring a touchdown on the following drive. During the drive, the first quarter ended and three plays later, the Rams went in for a touchdown on a hard run by Matt Fai. On the extra point, Dustin Briggs bobbled a high snap and rolled to the left and connected on a miraculous two-point conversion to the kicker, Jamie Dobbindick, putting the Rams up eight to seven. That's an unbelievable play by Briggs. Central Lions punter proved to be one of their best offensive players throughout the game. Late in the second quarter, he pinned JSPC deep in their own territory. Then the fumble bug bit the Rams. One of four costly fumbles on the day. Rams defense stuffed them, but Central Lion converted a short field goal to go back 10 to 8 at halftime. 22 yard try from the left hash. Good snap. The kick is up and good. good. Central Lion George Little Rock has the lead. 159 to go in the first half. 10 to 8 is the score. Right. The Rams have 89 yards total offense, 54 rushing, 35 passing, so they have some balance. Central Lion 100 yards rushing. Uh, that's they have not even attempted a pass. Uh, the Rams have uh, seven first downs, three rushing, three passing, one by penalty. Central Lion five first downs. The Rams have been penalized four times, and as Rick mentioned, the two tur the two lost fumbles are huge right now in this ball game. Well, on the other hand, the Rams' uh, drive was a short one because of a Central Lion George Little Rock fumble. So, as the only scoring threat of the third quarter came when Central Lion recovered a Matt Lautner fumble at midfield. The Lions drove to the 10-yard line but missed a field goal after some good defensive plays by the Rams.
In the first drive of the fourth quarter, Dustin Briggs got the Rams to the 20-yard line, but the drive stalled. Central Lion had to use their punter to gain field position again, and he launched a 63-yard punt, pinning the Rams at the five-yard line. It was Dustin Briggs and Courtney Berry's time to shine. Lamonds gets him out of bounds. First down from the five. Joe Gibbs and the Rams go all the way to the Lions 34. That's a 59 yard pass play. I'm going to make it 60 yards just for a nice round number. <laughs> Good coverage. What a throw by Dustin Briggs and what a catch by Courtney Barry. That's the kind of stuff that you see in the NFL. Two plays later, what looked like the big play the Rams needed ended in disaster when Reed Kenny was stripped by Curtis Eben as he approached the goal line. As he called down. No, they call it the fumble. It's a fumble. It's a fumble. And Central Lion has the ball at their 10 yard line. A 21 yard pass play to Reed Kinney. But the officials ruled a fumble. They said the ground did not cause it. Fifth fumble of the game. Forced one loss, Doug. 3.15 to go. They need a first down or two. Here's uh, Olderman, maybe one. Speak on the line. Option right, and the quarterback is hit, and he'll go down. Zach Fox, three in a row. They'll keep it on the ground to Eben, and he's forward and short. will be short, but he kept those legs driving into the 16. Hope this works out better than the last one. Wobbly snap, but no pressure. Briggsy uh, has to go back. The stubborn Rams refused to give up, and once again, Dustin Briggs gave the team another scoring opportunity on the punt return. He was sprung by Todd Walker's selfless block on the edge. They'll call it. The Rams are in business with 134 to go. We got a Ram down, Doug. Todd Walker, but Todd Walker made that return with a huge block on number 53, Robinson. Nate Robinson. And Todd Walker rang his own bell that time. He may not see the end of this game, but I'll tell you what, if the Rams could score in the next minute and a half, you better talk to Todd Walker and talk about that block that he laid. The Rams are 27 yards away from the end zone. Again, to have a reasonable chance at a field goal, they need to get to around the 10. Two timeouts remaining for both teams. And again, you're right, Joe, uh, Todd Walker saved the day on that return. Close heartbreaking defeat. Briggs option. Right side to five. Dances around and gets about three yeah, on the far side. Out, Doug. Give us the call. Illegal Chalk block. block. Chalk block below the waist. And 22. I set. Slot and split right. On the ground. Five to the 31. 14 for the first down. Briggs to throw. He's got time. He bullets it. Complete. Short of the first down, but it's inside the 20 to Reed Kinney. And the clock moves with 42-41. 13-yard gain, third down and one. Rams are still in the huddle, 35-34. They need a yard for the first down. Keep it on the ground, first down to the 15 for Lautner. They're getting awfully close to field goal range. The clock will stop here after the three-yard gain so the chains can be moved. 23 seconds, Doug. Oh. Just when you think it can't get any more tense. 
Ram does. Two timeouts left. Rams spend a timeout here to set up, plan their strategies. Timeout on the field. Rams down by two. We're coming back. Right down to the nubbins after this from the Real Country Championship Club. First down and 10, JSPC at the Lions 15 yard line. The Rams are down 10 to 8. This will be a long field goal try for the sophomore Jamie Davendeck, who has, I think he's 0 for 3 this year on field goal attempts. Rams uh, do have one timeout left. They come out of the eye. Minahan wide right. Kenny tight end left. Robbins wing left. the five, Kenny at the four, and a first and goal, and I think you take your shot now, don't you, Joe? Use your last time out at the four, first and goal. That's what the Rams are doing. They're going to set up the field goal. Now the ball's going to be marked at the four-yard line. Out on the field. We're going to keep it right here so we don't take any chances of missing this. Here's what it boils down to. If the field goal's good, then JSPC in all likelihood is in the state title game. If it's no good, we know for sure that they are not. Wow. <laughs> Sophomore kicker, Joe, that hasn't made one all year long. Tyler Caius is your snapper. Dustin Briggs is your holder. Well, and we've got 15 seconds to go in the state semifinals. <laughs> wow. Unbelievable. Oh, boy. Well, the Rams out of timeouts, I would think. They... It would have been nice if they could have gotten that ball closer to the center of the field, but uh, here goes the ball game. Coach Kibbe out there talking to the troops. Down by two. Grants are going to go for a play from the scrimmage. No timeouts left. They're going to go for it. Four receivers right. Shotgun for Briggs. He's being pressured. He gets it away. It's out of bounds. He'll have another shot. He just got away before Meester dumped him at the 10. Boy, that was... Because if the Rams get sacked, they won't have enough time. Now will the field goal unit come yeah, in? I saw Jamie Dobbendeck trotting on the field. Here comes a field goal attempt. Ten, ten seconds left. That was a real gamble. Oh, boy. So here we go. 21-yard field goal try. Dobbendeck to win it, to put the Rams into the finals. George Lamarck wins the game. The Rams season is over. The Rams season ends. And what a great year it was. The kick is blocked. The Rams don't make a field goal all season. A good try. And that's it. There's one second left on the clock, but it won't matter. Came right up the middle. It was a hard block, Joe. And now the officials say roll the clock. The game is over. And uh, the Rams... End the season eight and four. The Lions are in the title game at 11 and one. They blocked the field goal officially as time expires, and that's it. Uh, Joe, it's going to be uh, one that people are going to look at and have an awful lot of fond memories of this football season. Yep. A lot of memories. Mo Kelly is from Boone, and of course Boone was the preseason favorite in District 7 of Class 3A, and Mo just says something about the experts said you couldn't win the district, but you did. And they said it couldn't beat Dennis, and then you did. Yeah, Dennis and Schleswig. And then, of course, they said you couldn't beat Harlan, and of course the Rams did. Come forward now and get medals and a semifinal round trophy. Coach, just a, a tremendous game, 
tremendous season, really. Well, I, yes, and I think back when the season started, I said there's going to be a lot of close ball games, and they're going to be decided in the fourth quarter, and uh, almost everyone except for two of them were decided in the fourth quarter. They could have gone either way. Uh, you could have won them all. You could have lost them all. Uh, you could have split. Uh, you know, it, they were just, it was an exciting season, a very much a tense field um, season with, uh, you know, it, it, you, you're uptight quite a bit, but it was a great, a great year for these guys, and they bounced back from, from uh, what looked like adversity. You know, the beginning of the year, they bounced back again on, on uh, Saturday night uh, from uh, deep in our own, own territory there to come out and almost pull it out. And uh, I can say nothing but great things about them. I think it was a tremendous win I w- or a tremendous play that we had. I just wish that uh, we could have had a win to, uh, to uh, keep playing this week. When you get into the uh, to the state playoffs, 16 teams in each class, and 15 of them are going to go home with their their last game being a loss. There's only one team that's going to going to finish the season with a win, and uh, you can't look at it as a as a defeat for the season. Really, it was really fun uh, being there, and the weather. I, I can't imagine what it was like as a player, but just as a fan and as an announcer, uh, uh, truly a thrill. A tremendous crowd. We just had a tremendous crowd. They did too. And uh, you could probably put it's just like going into a gym that has 100 people in it. You know, it's just deafening there if they're all making noise. And that's the way it was last night. And and I, we're just proud of the way they did. And we know we're losing some great football players. Uh, but But we've still got some pretty good ones coming back. and tough team at all times and even through the bad times when we struggled at the beginning of the season we were still right there we just didn't know how to win football games and we learned as a team we fought as a team we took criticism um, and ultimately that's what made us tougher and tougher each week and that's what gave us quite a bit of the swagger and the belief in the locker room that that not only we could win, but we were going to win. Uh, you know, to this day, there's there's no doubt in my mind that 
if we had to play those out, we would win each of those games and we would probably win the Central Lion um, game this time. It was guys working together and banding together to uh, be a team and to fight no matter what. The Harlem game was an absolute fist fight on the line of scrimmage, um, both sides of the ball. We had our work cut out for us. We had controlled line of scrimmage against Denison and and really dominated it. And that was not the case with, uh, with the Harlan game. Walker was still dealing with an ankle that had been probably three to four weeks at that point, but it was far worse than anybody really wanted to believe or really understood. Um, we had a good rotation between Mike and Harrington and myself um, on both sides of the ball, but it was it was a tough game. They were strong. We fought. That was probably, I think, possibly the biggest challenge from the line, controlling the line of scrimmage and dealing with the line of scrimmage that we had that entire year. The Harlan game was quite a bit different. Uh, had a much more community excitement, um, community energy around the game that just is hard to describe and hard to even really think back about. It was really one of the most exciting games that you could have potentially had in our situation. Uh, for the first time, I think the community really uh, truly believed in our ability. Uh, you know, as a team, we had a different swagger. Um, you, I think we really picked up our swagger at the Boone game and beating the Toriators, which were rated fourth at the time. Uh, and then coming off the, Har the Denison game, excuse me, um, they were a good football team and we showed that we were really a pretty darn good football team as well. Uh, going into that Harlan game, I think the community honestly started to believe in us. They were they were excited, but they finally started to truthfully believe in us. Um, and as a team, we had a lot of swagger. We had a lot of great leaders within the locker room. You know, the coaching staff was second to none from a leadership standpoint, but you know, this is a team that it took the first four games, five games of the year to truthfully learn how to win a football game and and figure out how to play at the end of the day as a team. Um, you know, guys like Matt Lautner had something to say on every single play, whether it was every single play in practice, whether it was every single play in the game. Lautner, Walker, Erickson, um, I, I, I was, I, I had my things to say. Uh, Mortensen in the in the huddle. Um, you know, we had some quiet guys, but we had a lot of guys that had a lot to say and were weren't afraid to to express their their leadership. weren't afraid to to uh, uh, talk a little bit, whether it was on in the huddle or in practice or on the game. And it, that really made it a lot of fun, but that also, that leadership truly made us a better team when it came down to the, um, the, the tough times. Going into the Denison game, I don't know how many people truthfully believed that we could compete and win the ball game. We heard a lot about how great Denison was, how statistically they were so much better of a team than what we were. But, um, you know, in the locker room, I don't think there was a doubt on any one of our minds that we were going to win that game. Outside of the locker room and the moms of all of our player, of all the players, I don't know how many people actually believed that JSPC was going to win that game. Uh, you know, on the game, we really dominated the line of scrimmage. We defensively played very well. We contained that run game. Uh, you know, we were told how great that run game was going to be, and we stepped up and we shut them down. Uh, 
You know, and then on the flip side of that, for every big play that it felt like we gave up, we seemed to have an answer, whether it was getting a turnover, an interception, uh, or a big play of our own. Every time that it felt like we got that big dagger that was the big play, there was some form of an answer that we had relatively quick after that. I don't know about everybody else's parents, but my parents were ecstatic with and, and shocked when we beat Denison and then we beat Harlan. Then we we're going to the dome. I think uh, at that point, it kind of felt like we were a team of destiny, and hell, even our parents were were bought into it. And it was amazing to uh, be in that environment where, even though uh, we were making mistakes, in in their eyes, we were doing that. We could do no wrong. And what an awesome, awesome feeling to have as a high school kid. We heard after the Denison game that there were some fans coming in asking why they were paying full price for for tickets when the game was going to be over by halftime anyway. And to quote Michael Jordan, we took that personally. In some ways it was fitting that we had to go to Harlan to play Harlan. Uh quote Ric Flair to be the man you gotta beat the man and for us to go somewhere that we had never gone as a county a school individually it only made sense that we had to go through the biggest roadblock to get to the dome and live out the goal that we set out early as each and every freshman class that walked through those doors the community pride in the team was very high after the Harlan game. Everybody was still in shock. I think even the players to some degree. And the fact that although we always said this year is the year we go to the Dome, it was actually the year that we went to the Dome. And we had police and escorts out of town for many of us. That was not exactly the police escorts that we thought we'd get out of town. But either way, the streets were lined, and we were on our way to the dome. Even though we'd just beat Denison, we weren't cocky going into the Harlan game at all. It was very workmanlike. It was almost like we expected to for a battle. And as... The line walked onto the field after the special teams. We didn't run onto the field all hyped up by any stretch. We walked on the field like we were on a mission, like we were going to work and we were going to battle. And that's what the game turned out to be, a slugfest. One swing after another. 